Right. Well, thank you for having me uh, back this weekend. Uh, I have been asking the Lord uh, for the last several weeks uh, what to bring uh, to my friends in Mississippi and watching at home and all around the country and the world. Uh, and I've, I've just been working lately with a lot of parents and a lot of parents, words I would use to describe many of the parents that I'm talking to would be lonely, isolated, stressed, frustrated, and overwhelmed. Parents are making a lot of decisions these days and uh, not certain of a lot of the decisions they're making in these uncertain times. And so uh, I want to talk to you this weekend about the fact that you're not the perfect parent. And everyone said, no, let's say that again. We, we're going to go loud on that. And at home, let your children know it. I'm not the perfect parent. And everyone agreed and said, I have a mom, Bonnie Cunningham. She lives in Branson, Missouri. But my mom, when we were kids, loved to wake my brother and I up to singing in the morning. And now I just want to tell this to every parent in here, especially of teenagers. I see some teenagers uh, in the room. They're not going to tell you this, but mom and dad, they want you to wake them up in the morning by singing. They do. Deep down, they want that. They're not admitting that. But they want you to walk into their room as my mom did, grab those curtains, pull them back while singing, rise and shine and give God the glory, glory, rise and shine. The other song my mom loved was, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord, I'm getting a lot of nods right now. How many of you have a singing mom? Would you raise your hand? All right, young people, raise your hand if you want your parents to sing more to you early in the morning. I know you want it. I know you just won't raise your hand. So let's talk a little bit today uh, just to encourage parents with the most important thing. What's the most important thing we need to be doing in this season? There's a lot of decisions that we need to make. There's a lot that we wrestle with, but sometimes we can allow the non-essential to distract us from the essential. And I wanna to talk today about the most important thing we need to be doing, mom and dad, during this season. But before we get to that, I just wanna uh, jump into some of the inner thoughts and inner struggles of a parent some of the motives that we deal with, and mom and dad and grandma and grandpa are going to uh, understand this and probably be able to amen this uh, along the way. But here's just a few thoughts I've picked up from parents over the years. Uh, this first one, parenting is mostly just informing kids how many more minutes they have of something. No smartphones for my kids. They need to suffer years of fleeting, awkward eye contact with strangers like I did. Parenting is 80% making empty threats and 20% picking up miniature toys off the floor. Or this last one. My seven-year-old daughter asked me twice today, what poison would kill someone the fastest? And now I'm wondering if I've underestimated her. As my friend Kevin Lehman says, I have seen the enemy and they are small. Can I get an amen on that one? Parenting ain't for wimps. If you have your Bibles, here and at home, uh, or wherever you're at today, turn to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to see the words of Jesus, and there's a teaching that we sometimes read through quickly that we need to spend a little bit of time with understanding and kind of setting the pace uh, for what we're talking about this weekend. And I love how Jesus, the master teacher, asks questions. Uh, it, this to me reminds me of my mom and dad who would ask me questions all the time and there was only one right answer. And that's what Jesus does when he's teaching and he asks these questions and the answer is obvious. Look what he says in Matthew 7, starting in verse 9. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then... Underline this in your Bible, because I have it underlined in mine. Though you are evil, though you are not perfect, though you are sinful, Amy and I often have to wake up in the morning and remind ourselves of this as we approach the day. We are sinful parents. We will make mistakes. But even though we are evil, we know how to give good gifts to our children. Jesus says, you then, though you are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? I am not the perfect parent, but I know the perfect parent. 
I am not the perfect parent, but I want my days as a parent to be spent pointing my children to the perfect parent. And in this one thing, we've got to get this one thing down. Of all the decisions and all the crazy and these uncertain times that we're going through, we have to get this down. And we can't be distracted by the non-essentials, which we're going to talk a little bit about. We can't be distracted by motives that maybe guided us pre-COVID-19. We need to get back to this one thing. I believe if we do this one thing, mom and dad, uh, we can wake up in the morning with it on our hearts and minds. Our head can hit the pillow at night, making this a priority. This is the, the time of year that a lot of families head to the beach, and they're all in their matchy-matchy outfits, and they're going to get a photographer out there, and they're going to line up all perfect. And I, I see so many perfect beach shots that I had to go looking for some that I know didn't turn out so well, and I found a couple of them. This is actually one of my favorite ones uh, right here. Uh, but the next one, I still cannot fathom how this took place, <laughs> this one here. Like, how much momentum do you have to get to launch your child that way? But now, there, here's the difference between mom and dad. Mom's face is, is saying what? I'm a terrible parent. I'm a horrible parent, but what's dad's face saying? We're having a good time. We're having a good time. I am not the perfect parent. And as, as we jump into this today, I, I really want to spend a couple of moments talking about our motives, because we all deal with these. We all deal, as flawed parents, as parents who make mistakes, we all deal with these motives at some time or another. And I got to admit, I have dealt with all seven of these motives at some point in my parenting uh, over the last 17 years. The first motive is what I call vanity parenting. Vanity parenting is using your child's attributes and accomplishments to try to impress others. There's another term for it. It's called Facebook. It's called social media, where we're constantly putting best foot forward. We're constantly uh, showing the highlight reels of our kids because we believe that if if our kids look successful, that means we're great parents. We have fallen for this faulty input-output theory of parenting that says whatever I pour into my child is what I will get out of my child. And the Hebrew term for that is ah! Not true. In the Greek, it's bologna. But we, we, we think, I got to have my kid looking good, being good, excelling in every activity that we place him or her in so that people will see that as a reflection of my parenting. That moves us to the next one, perfection parenting. Setting high standards for success in every opportunity, activity, or sport. You're going to notice a lot of these motives have popped up on the front page or the front cover of magazines such as Time. That I, I want my kids to excel at everything they pursue. Mom and dad, we need to rest in the fact this weekend that one of the blessings of childhood is discovery. That we don't have to lock kids into something and expect them in everything they try to be awesome at it. My firstborn daughter, she is about to turn 17. Uh, everything she does, she wants to do it with excellence. And I remember sitting him down one day and telling him, listen, my job as your dad is to help you discover what God has called you to do, how he's gifted you, how he's, how he's preparing you, how your personality fits with that. And I want to walk alongside with you and help you discover that. Corinne, I know right now the, the metrics at school, and they were very young when I was having this conversation with them, that they, they got rid of letter grades in our school, and they went with, you're either, you've either mastered it or you're progressing. And I told my kids, I go, I don't need you to master everything. I, and, and this is a struggle that parents have today. We have a difficult time separating character from competency. And I'm going after character. There's a lot of things my kids aren't going to be great at, but so long as they give it their best shot, like I'll give you an example. I'm, I, I was raised by two engineers. And let's just say God didn't give me a math brain. And I brought home terrible grades in math. And when I was writing the book Trophy Child, I called my dad. I said, Dad, I've, I've been trying to think this through. And I can't think of a time that you were ever mad at me for my bad, like, 
failing grades in math. And, and he said, you know, Ted, you studied for math more than any other subject, and you still got bad grades. So I knew we weren't dealing with a character issue. I just knew God didn't give you a math brain. I remember at that time on that phone call asking him, Dad, when did you know I wouldn't be a professional athlete? To which my dad responded with, <laughs> you lack several things necessary for athletics, skill, speed, balance, coordination. That's my loving, honest father uh, right there. But you don't have to be perfect at everything. And that leads to the competitive parent, the one who is uh, constantly comparing the strengths and weaknesses of their child with other children. This, just, this either fills you with false pride or unnecessary defeat. Like, let your child be who God created your child to be. I call it ROI parenting, and our, our businessmen and women uh, in here and at home will know what that means. It's a return on investment. It's sticking with a sport or activity or asking your child to lock into something for a period of time uh, until there's a benefit, a scholarship, or uh, as it was with us when we put our daughter in dance in Branson, I wanted her to stick with it until she could actually get in a show on stage in Branson. But I had to quickly understand that, that we need to redefine commitment in our home. Commitment doesn't need to be your entire childhood. For us, commitment is season to season or year to year. Meaning if you sign up for a sport and day one starts and you come home and you don't like the coach or you don't like the time of the early practice, you were in this until the end of the season. When we took our son to karate and we set him down and I saw on the wall, this is his first day, black belt is our goal. And I said, it doesn't have to be your goal, but now that you're in it, you're in it until you test for the first belt. We need as parents to get to a place where we have a motive and, and understand commitment well. Just a couple more, the gifted parent. This is the parent that picks, pictures the child as extra special. So they're constantly looking for extra special opportunities for the child. And we gotta be careful that we don't fall into the mindset that God did something with my child that he didn't do with ordinary children. It leads to rescue parenting. Rescue parenting is protecting your child from pain, risk, and loss. And, and again, I'm not saying here a child's going toward the stove to grab a pot of hot boiling water and going to pour it on themselves, and you're like, oh, they need to learn. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about not rescuing them from a playground situation where they need to learn skills like you and I learn skills. We learn life negotiation skills on the playground, in the sandbox, and here's what we've done as parents. We, we have created environments for our children to succeed rather than teaching them to succeed in environments that they can't control. We want to move away from that rescue parenting. And again, you probably are picturing some of the Time magazine covers with some of these. And the last one is companion parenting, seeking friendship by elevating your child to the level of a spouse or depend, descending as a parent to the level of a sibling and wanting to be your child's BFF rather than the parent. My friend Alex Hamaya says something often at his church, uh, Battle Creek Church in Tulsa, when he's encouraging parents to, to send their kids to camp, summer camp. And he'll say, you know, you're going to have a lot of conversations with your kids. Alex just has this simple statement that I love. He just says, be the parent. Be the parent. Make decisions uh, for your child. There's a lot of motives we deal with, but there's also a lot of choices. And if I can just encourage you, mom and dad, as we look at this one thing today, the one thing that's the most important, I wanna, I wanna just talk about a couple things that sidetrack us, decisions and choices that we need to make. And sometimes we think it's the most important thing, but it's not. Let's start with formula. I remember when we, uh, nursing didn't work for my daughter and we had to give her formula and parents came at us. Can I just tell you, mom and dad, you were under no obligation to explain or defend your parenting choices. It's gonna be different for each home. Some of you are like, my kid's not gonna take formula. I don't want my kid to be bad at math. It wasn't the formula, okay? How about this next one? We were judged for the pacifier. I remember the looks we got. Again, you're under no obligation to explain or defend your parenting choices. My daughter used a pacifier until she was three. And sure, she can't pronounce her S's, but she has nailed the other 25 letters and we're proud of her, okay? So don't judge my daughter. How about the next one? 
Oh, discipline. Listen, I'll go back to Bonnie Cunningham for a second. She never would have put up with this. Raise your hand if you have a parent that never would have put up with that in the store. My mom would have stepped over me and said, hey, you can get your own ride home if you're going to act like that, and kept walking. But you see the meltdowns and parents stress over how do we deal with this? How do we handle this? And discipline's important, yes, but modes of discipline, parents choose differently. And we need to be honoring of choices and strategies. Oh, this next one, I hear parents stressing over the school bus. And I remember when we were thinking about putting Corinne on the school bus, people were like, oh, you're not going to put her on the bus. I'm like, that. I grew up. Raise your hand if you grew up on the bus. Yeah, I went on a bus. Where else are you going to learn about life? You got to go on the bus. How many of you remember, this will throw some of you off. How many of you remember when a bus driver could kick off the bus kids who were misbehaving? Anybody remember that? Can you but could you imagine what would happen to that bus driver today? I've been kicked off the bus more than you could ever imagine because I wasn't good at math, I wasn't good at sports, and I go, Dad, what was I good at? He goes, God gave you a mouth, and we prayed your entire childhood that God would redeem your mouth. But I grew up on the bus. I remember getting kicked off, and the goal, if you got kicked off the bus, I grew up in the cornfields of uh, northern Illinois, and the goal was, if you get kicked off the bus for being bad, you got to beat the bus home. So you would see the kids going through the cornfields to get home, and so long as you stood out ahead of the you know, combine, you were fine, okay? You would make it home, no problem. How about this next one that parents are stressing over today? And some of you are going, you will not talk about that. You're right, I won't. We're going to go on to the next one. Technology. I get asked this question all the time, when, 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 when? I want you to hold on to that last one for just a second because we're at the most important thing. There's so much that this, it distracts us as parents that if we're not careful, it will keep us from the most essential. It'll keep us from the most important priority in the home. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through 7 says it like this. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. I have two children, and my greatest desire for them as a dad is that they will love the Lord their God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their strength. I want them to have that love for the Lord. Verse 6 says, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. That's speaking to the parents. It starts with me. So before... I question the love my children have for the Lord. I have to ask the question, what is my love for the Lord? Because what's on my heart finds its way on the heart of my child. That's what verse 7 says. Impress them on your children. How do you impress something upon your children? You talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. From the moment you get up to the time you go to sleep at night, as you walk along the way and as you sit at home, you're speaking of the Lord. And remember, mom and dad, this. In everything that you're doing, and yes, keep in mind, going back, not the perfect parent. Get that. Let that sink in. But our children see everything we do. They hear everything we say. They forget nothing, and then they repeat. Can I say that again for grandma and grandpa who may be in here or watching and thinking, I've raised my kids. My kids are raised, and they're gone. Grandma and grandpa, your grandchildren are watching, listening, remembering and repeating. This is how we impress messages upon their hearts and everything that our nation is dealing with. From COVID to racial reconciliation, all of these are conversations that are being had around, as Ronald Reagan said it, the greatest change in America happens around the dinner table because this is where children are watching and listening, remembering and repeating. My son and I, we love watching YouTube clips and. I've shared this with you before, but his favorite YouTube clip is the German Coast Guard. If you get time, this would be a great way to introduce this Deuteronomy 6 principle to your children. But if you get time tonight, type in youtube.com, German Coast Guard. Guys being trained day one on the German Coast Guard and a mayday comes in. Mayday, mayday, we are sinking, we are sinking. Uh, hello? This is the German Coast Guard. Mayday, mayday, we are sinking, we are sinking. Uh, what are you sinking about? My son thinks that's the funniest clip he's ever heard. He falls over in laughter. And a few weeks later, I forgot about that clip. This was years and years ago. I'm driving down the road, and I'm singing a hymn from my childhood that goes like this. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. And from the back seat, I heard, and what were you singing about? And I go, there it is. 
They see everything, they hear everything, they forget nothing, and then they repeat. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I want to take a turn here for just a second and speak to the young people in the room and at home and along the way. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. I, I want to encourage you, be a joy to your parents. How do you be a joy to your parents? Well, I listen to them. I obey them. They tell me clean my room. I clean my room. They tell me get down here for dinner. I get down here for dinner. There's a better way to bring joy to mom and dad. Proverbs 23, 22 through 25 reads, listen to your father who gave you life. If you've ever wondered why dad ever said, I brought you into this world, I will take you out. He gets that from Proverbs 23, 22. Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Wisdom, instruction, and insight as well. Look at verse 24 and 25. The father of a righteous child has great joy. A man who fathers a wise son rejoices in him. May your father and mother rejoice. One thing you can do, and this is where I really want to bring it home for us this weekend, and, and, and to see the, the most important thing, that our children love the Lord and that they walk in the truth. They know Jesus and they walk in his teachings. They know Jesus and they make decisions based on the scripture and the source of truth. Mom and dad, we have a very, very small window for our children to watch and listen, remember and repeat. And, and then they're gone. They'll continue watching, they'll continue listening, but let's talk about this influence we have even after they leave home. Parenting is for a season, but being a parent is for a lifetime. We've got about an 18 to 20 year window for parenting, but being a parent follows you into grandparenting. And I'm, I'm reminded of what theologian Kenny Chesney said when he said, don't blink. Because just like that, you're six years old and you take a nap, you wake up and you're 25 and your high school sweetheart becomes your wife, don't blink. Because just like that, you might miss your babies growing like mine did, turning into moms and dads. Next thing you know, your better half of 50 years is there in bed and you're praying God takes you instead. Trust me, friends, 100 years goes faster than you think. The days go slow, but the years go fast. And when we encourage the parents at our church with this in Branson, Missouri, every child that is dedicated at our church at the end, and really we're dedicating mom and dad, and we're, we're commissioning mom and dad to, to lead their children to the Lord and to lead their children in truth. And when they leave the stage, we give each one of them a jar. Look at this big jar of marbles. It, it can weigh like 25, 30 pounds. Like they need one more thing to carry. The moms always look at us like, come on, right? What are you doing? But this is Miles' jar, and you can see, I can see, yeah, 912. And each marble in this jar represents a week they have left with their child. So imagine, they're holding a baby, they're holding this jar of marbles, and we're saying, we want you to make the most of time, this season of parenting that you have. And every week, take a marble out, and we want you to look at this and we want you to be uh, deliberate in your decisions. We want you to be intentional with the time you're going to spend together at home or, or driving in the car from the time you get up to the time you go to sleep at night. What I love about this jar, on the top of the jar, it has the word control. And on the bottom, it has the word influence. Parenting is a journey from control to influence. And, and we tell parents... With every week, with every marble you take out of this jar, you are, and this is a bad dad joke, but will you laugh through the mask for me just a little bit tonight? I always say, as you're losing your marbles, <sighs> okay, thank you. Uh, keep in mind, if you have toddlers right now, it's the most control you'll ever have. With every week, month, year of your child's life, you are losing control, but hopefully you are replacing that control with influence. 
So go back to that picture a few moments ago with the children on technology. Because I love doing parenting retreats and seminars, and messages at church, because I get all sorts of messages afterwards. When is the right age to date? When is the right age to get my child a smartphone? When is the right age for them to do sleepovers and get asked all these questions? Any, what I'm going to say is a non-essential issue and everything I just mentioned, smartphones and the age and all that, I don't have a scripture to call you to for what age your child gets a smartphone. So again, that's a choice and a decision mom and dad have to make. But all of those decisions fall within this control to influence. Sleepovers, I get asked that one, do you allow your kids to do sleepovers? I say, well, you know, when they were little, I didn't because I was in control. They didn't have any control. But now my daughter, 17, does. And you're like, oh, I'm not for those. Well, let me tell you, here's the problem. If, if you say no and put a hard no on something, I said, my daughter next year will be at a full-time sleepover called college. And I'll have no control. I want to influence that. And it's true with everything that's going on. Here's, I believe, one of the biggest mistakes we make as parents. One of the biggest mistakes we make as parents is treating our children like children right up until the very day we expect them to be adults. Instead, it's this journey of moving them from control to influence. And many of you probably have the story in this room of going to college and you met someone who was controlled, 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 controlled by mom and dad, dropped off at college freshman year, and they lost their minds because they weren't prepared. We want to move from control to influence. And here's, here's the most important thing, this love for the Lord and the, and the truth upon their hearts, mom and dad, of all the things we've talked about and all the things you may be struggling with and the things we haven't talked about and the things we haven't hit and the things like, yeah, but what about this? Ted, we haven't even figured out if we're going back to school in the fall. This is one of the reasons why I feel the Lord impressed it upon my heart to bring this message this weekend because we're entering into even more uncertain times. And mom and dad are going to have to answer a lot of questions and make a lot of decisions. Let's just keep this one the priority. Let's make this the most important. You are the primary author of your child's heart. They're watching, they're listening, they're remembering, and they're repeating. And to go back to my mom, think about it. I, I can still picture her every morning walking into our room and singing, this is the day, this is the day, rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. She would give us pep talks as she was getting ready to leave for work, and then she'd walk down the stairs. One of her last words to me walking out the door almost every morning was, Teddy, don't let the turkeys get you down. Know who you are. Know your parents love you. Know who you are in the Lord. And they were off to work. Paul said it this way to young Timothy, and these passages uh, I take very personally, and maybe many of you do as well. I'm sure not all in here, and, and many at home don't have this story. You were led to the Lord here at Pine Lake, or maybe in a college ministry, or by a friend or a family member. It wasn't mom or dad. But Paul says this and reminds Timothy of this, I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. A couple chapters away in 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 15. But as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it. Young people, to continue to walk in the truth that mom and dad have imparted in you when you leave home. Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. We, we at our house call it the us bus. And uh, all four of us are on the bus right now. Uh, but pretty soon my daughter's going to drive her own bus out the driveway and she's going to start her own family. And my son will be, I'm sure, a few years behind that. Uh, the, uh, this is a little model that I created a couple of years ago to help teach to my kids uh, all the, the different sources that we use to make decisions in our home. And we actually call it the us bus. And in the driver's seat is the scripture. Like we, even if we don't have the answer right now, we know where to go to get the answer. I want my kids to be making decisions based upon the scripture. In the passenger seat, you have tradition. And I've visited churches where sometimes I feel that's flipped or scripture and tradition are both in the driver's seat. And I tell my kids, tradition is very good. 
It helps guide us, and I use commentaries. I consider commentaries like tr tradition. Uh, after I prepare a message, I go back to make sure I haven't come up with something new. I want the collective wisdom of church fathers and even denominational leaders to be guiding what I'm, I'm reading in the scripture. Behind that is reason. I had someone challenge me a couple of weeks ago and say, I think reason and tradition should be in the front seat as well. And I said, well, I don't put reason up there because uh, I don't trust my mind's ability alone over the collective wisdom of others. And I, I said, I was taught in seminary, if I read something in scripture and find something brand new that no one else has ever discovered, I'm probably wrong. So I don't let reason drive the bus. Experience, right? We all have experience and we all make decisions today uh, based on something that may have happened 10 years ago. Man, I remember when I did that and I lost that job. I remember when I said that and that relationship was hurt or broken. Oh, I don't want to, experience is a great teacher. But just because it happened to you doesn't mean it will happen to me. And I want my kids to understand this. Your story is very valid, but I can't make your story my authority. And a lot of times people are like, don't even have emotions on the bus. We shouldn't be listening to our emotions. But I want my kids to know, Proverbs 4.23, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And my friend Ryan Pinnell, speaking of emotions, he says, and he's a marriage intensive therapist, he says, uh, our emotions are like our children. We should listen to them, we should care for them, but we should not allow them to make major decisions for our family. When my kids pull out of the driveway in their own bus, I wanna know that scripture is in the driver's seat. I wanna know, and sometimes mom and dad are like, yeah, but Ted, they're not following it. I, I know, I wanna make sure they know the truth. I want them to continue in that. I want them to drive off with that. People come to me at church sometimes and they'll say, I, I speak a lot on marriage and so obviously my passion is I want my children, I want my son to embrace his biological sex and marry the opposite sex. I want my daughter to embrace her biological sex and marry the opposite sex. And gender and sexuality and marriage is always on the table to be redefined in our culture. And people will come to, to me all the time at church and they'll be like, Ted, so-and-so, and it may be an evangelical leader or someone who was once an evangelical leader. Ted, so-and-so this week said this about marriage, and what they said sounded good. Can you help me process this? And I'll go, let me tell you why it sounded good, if we can put the us bus back up for just a second. I said, here's why what they said sounded good, and I, I'm always walking through this with my kids. They moved, this person that you're talking about, moved scripture over to the passenger seat. Didn't put it in the back seat, just moved it over to the passenger seat, and they took experience from their family and they put it in the driver's seat. And I said, the reason why it sounds good to you is because scripture is still in the front seat, it's just no longer driving the bus. I want my kids to be listening to the news with me, and hear a news anchor say that Jesus Christ was not a perfect man. I want my kids to hear that and be like, we know the truth. We know that Jesus lived a sinless life upon this earth. And he gave his life for us. I, that's what scripture driving the bus. And when you get these moments as a parent, this is the joy that we read about in Proverbs, that they're walking in it, they know it. Mom and dad, this is the most important thing, that we would be impressing a love for the Lord upon the hearts of our children and then putting the scripture in the driver's seat, the scriptures we just read, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Mom and dad, wherever you are on your parenting journey, and talk to the parents with children at home, but I also wanna to talk to all the parents with children who have left. Can I encourage you, delete the narrative that's repeating in your head, that wakes you up at night, that says, it's too late and it's my fault. Here's a new approach. I want to encourage you, don't feed your regrets. Ask Jesus to redeem your remaining days. Don't fall for the lie, it's too late. My friend Ron Deal at Family Life in Little Rock he says it this way, God's design for the home is perfect. The homes of God's people, however, have never been, nor do I suspect, ever will be perfect. Mom and dad, that you would continue to walk in the truth yourself. That your love for the Lord 
would come through every day that your children, from the time you get up to the time you go to sleep at night, as you walk along the way and as you sit at home, that your children would be watching, that they would be listening. I know they're remembering and that they would repeat. I leave you with the words of John and 3 John. And I, I just, I want, I want young people, children of parents, whether you're at home or you are, have left the home, I want you to hear his heart in these words. It gave me great joy when some believers came and testified about your faithfulness to the truth, telling how you, con- telling how you continue to walk in it. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Would you pray with me today? Father, I want to start by praying for the one who has never placed faith in Jesus, that today would be the day that they remove themselves from the driver's seat, that they confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in their heart that he has been raised from the dead, that they would confess their sins before you, that they would begin to learn the scriptures, the scriptures that make us wise unto salvation. For the young person who's still living at home, that they would be a source of great joy to their parents, that they would walk in the truth as they're in the transition from control to influence, and and as they leave, as they leave home, that they would continue in what they have learned, that they would continue to, to move forward in life, knowing what your word teaches, letting it be their guide, letting it be their lamp through life. Father, I pray for grandparents that are thinking through today lifestyle choices of children and grandchildren. Hear from them almost every week. And the pain and the sadness, and that it often turns to frustration and anger. I just pray a special blessing over them today. That they would Stop wasting the energy on it's too late, I can't do anything, I can't move forward, that they would move forward loving their children and grandchildren, honoring their children and grandchildren because they have intrinsic automatic value. They've been personally autographed by God because they're image bearers of God. I'm asking that you comfort them today. And I believe I pray for all parents as a parent myself who uh, um, loses my temper, gets frustrated with asking or answering question after question after question. We lose our patience. We get frustrated. We say things, give us the boldness to apologize, to confess that before our children, confess that before you. We just pray for homes of honor. And as we learned last week about the blessing, that that would be part of our homes and be part of children blessing parents and parents blessing children and grandchildren blessing grandparents. Thank you for what you continue to do at Pine Lake. I'm grateful for a church uh, that allows a message such as, this, such as this that can be a little more specific and targeted, uh, but hopefully to continue to be a blessing. May we always be people of hope. Anyone who is among the living still has hope. I pray that over this family today. And it's in the good name of Jesus that we pray it.